Okay. There you go, all to there you. you. Um, thank you very much, Joe, for the introduction and thank you everyone for um, participating in this, um, joining this online talk. Um, so for those who are not familiar with the format, we do like 40 minute presentation and then we have time for, uh, for questions at the end. Um, and um, just to give a bit of background so that you know who I am. Um, so I'm a research fellow at UCL, the Institute of Education. Um, and I work on a project called Action, Action Against Stunting. Uh, so it's a project that aims to understand um, why children are, children are stunted, which means that they don't grow as well as they could in uh, some low and middle uh, income countries. Uh, so that's my current job at the moment. But uh, obviously, as you can see from the title of um, this talk, I won't talk about that. Uh, and I will be presenting research that I did during my PhD at Birkbeck University. Uh, and I could complement this research on noise um, with some uh, master's project last year at UCL. So the way I prepared this talk um, is to um, actually um, present different studies on the topic uh, because one of my key points during this talk would be to say that whether noise um, is negative for children's learning and performance depends a lot on the context. So I think it gives a better overview of the topic to present different studies instead of giving really in depth uh, uh, into one study. So um, I will not give all the methodological details for all the studies. Um, but I've put the references and if you if you have any question or anything you want to discuss, we can do that um, at the end. Um, one thing that I really enjoyed when working um, about noise is that um, everyone has a, an idea about it, everyone can say something. So um, I could talk about my research in family dinners or um, uh, events and uh, it would be fine, like people would not leave the room and walk away. Um, so some people would say, oh, it's really hard for me to work with noise in the background um, because it's distracting me. Some people on the contrary would say, oh, it's very uh, boring to work without um, in silence, without any stimulation. So I put the TV on the background. Um, and personally, I'm, I consider myself as quite sensitive to noise and um, especially when I'm trying to talk to people in noisy settings. So um, work events that used to happen where you have some noise around, um, it makes it difficult for me to understand people because I'm not a native English speaker. So if I, if I miss some information, I get lost quite quickly. And it's even worse if you give me some uh, wine to drink at the same time. So that's the personal story behind it. Um, more formally in research, um, the way you define noise um, is a sound that prevents, something that prevents the transmission of a signal. So if you think about telecommunication, uh, you pick up your phone, you're calling a friend, you are trying to transmit a message, but the line is a bit funny. Um, th there is some like um, blurred sounds, like you, you don't get your message transmitted properly. So this is because there is noise on the line. Um, and if you want to gener generalize a definition of noise beyond these um, situations of communicating with someone, you can define noise as a sound that is not wanted uh, and that is not pleasant. So um, when you look at the research about noise, the actual experiments that are done on, on, the, on this theme, uh, what people do is that they, they ask people to do a task and they display some sounds that are not relevant to the task. Um, so <clears throat> uh, for example, if you try to um, a child is trying to do some homework and they are hearing some math and they are hearing like TV in the background um, and the TV show has nothing to do with the math that they are trying to do. So it's irrelevant to the task they are trying to do. Um, and I hope you can see from this definition that it's very um, um, relative. So what, what you define as a noise is really relative to what you're trying to do in the moment. And it has usually negative impact connotation by default. Um, but I really want to highlight the fact that it depends on your task and on the situation. So 
when I was uh, preparing this presentation, I just um, went on Google and I tried to find pictures of classroom situations. And I found these two pictures that uh, were quite interesting because in the first one, you can see that the teacher is explaining the concept. So it's uh, probably physics or chemistry. Um, and the pupils are really well behaved, they are sitting um, around the table, they're raising their hand to ask a question, as not to interrupt the teacher. So here is this typical situation where the teacher is trying to give information um, and any other sound um, that would interrupt her would be seen as negative for instruction. Um, but you, you have different situations in the classroom. So in the second picture, um, you have groups of people talking uh, with each other or working together. And for example, um, for the group of pupils who are talking with each other, a noise would be something that comes from outside of the group. So they will be, they will be talking, they will be generating uh, some sounds themselves, and what would be annoying for them would be anything outside of the group. And that would not be the same uh, for the teacher who is engaged in another conversation. Um, so now that I've shown these different situations, so what can we say about the noise. So when you hear some sound that is not relevant for what you are doing, is it is it always a problem? Um, well, when you are thinking about situations of communication, so you're trying to hear someone or you're trying to have like a discussion, well, basically it's really hard to find an advantage of someone talking over you, like noise mostly has a negative impact on the transmission of information. Um, and in more formal term, it means that uh, if the teacher is trying to say something, um, but that uh, some children are talking over or there are some noise from elsewhere from covering the message. Children miss information and they need to fill the gap. So they miss some words, they miss some sounds from what the teacher is saying and they need to reconstruct what they lost. Um, and for that they need to use their language skills. And uh, we know that for children it's tricky because their language skills are still developing. And it's particularly tricky for children in their early school years who are younger um, and whose classrooms are the noisiest. Uh, it's tricky for children who experience difficulties with language, uh, who have a hearing impairment because they struggle to hear in the first instance. And also uh, for children with English as an additional language. Um, and it's a bit the situation that I explained before with me trying to talk to people um in english because when it's not your native language uh, you have less knowledge um and less resources to fill the gap so to compensate for the information you lost because of the noise and even if children do manage to understand what the, the teacher is saying um it's more effortful if there is background noise and th then they have less resources to well do what the teacher is asking them to do or think about really the meaning of what is being communicated. Um, and so right. over can I just interrupt for a minute? Your earrings yeah. are making background noise with the microphone. <laughs> my they're... earrings? Yes. Are you kidding? <laughs> I will remove my earrings live. Sorry to ask you that they're lovely earrings, but you know. <laughs> I did, I had no idea. Thank you for letting me know. That's right. It's just Sorry funny about that. you're talking about noise, but we have some noise from your earrings. There you go. Thank Sorry you for interrupt. letting me know. <laughs> no earring then. Is it better? <laughs> um, so that was for the situation of communication. And um, when children are engaged in a solo task is another type of activity they're engaged in in the classroom. And um, here the, the answer is less clear cut. So um, basically, if they hear some sounds that are not relevant for the task, whether it's negative depends on different things. So it's a bit of the typical answer of a researcher to say like, it depends. Um, but my role when I was doing my PhD was to understand what it depends on so that we can understand uh, in which context noise is negative. And I will um, present three factors here. So the type of sound that children are hearing, um, the tasks they're engaged in, and also their individual characteristics. And so we start with the type of sound. Um, and so there are various sounds that you can hear in a classroom and also in the in in your home if you are if you are trying to do learning activity at home um, 
the, there is sound from the outside of the building. So um, noise coming from um, uh, the street, from cars passing by, from airplanes, trains. So that's external noise. Um, and you also have uh, noise coming from the inside. So uh, electronic equipment, uh, if you think of printers, uh, ventilators, it's something I really noticed also um, well, in my previous office, we had uh, hair conditioning. We had like, uh, it was always on and you wouldn't notice it very much when it's on because it's a constant background noise. But when it was, when it was turned off, I could really feel like a difference. Um, and you finally have noise generated from the people inside the building. So it's pupils in the classroom who are talking with each other, who are um, moving around, dropping stuff on the floor, using their object. Um, and if you look at research, um, usually external noise is studied in what, uh, what is called community studies, where researchers go to find communities that are living in particularly noisy areas. So for example, um, families living near um, Heathrow Airport, um, and they will, they will see how pupils are doing um, in terms of learning and how classrooms are coping with that. Um, and these studies are really important. Um, but I won't mention them here because uh, these are studies that, like, that involve um, lots of political decisions. And if you want to find solutions for noise in these type of studies, uh, you need to involve a lot of uh, different people at the community policy level. Um, and um, as a PhD student in a field of education, I wanted to focus on internal noise because first, if uh, classrooms are not situated in a particularly noisy area. Usually the noise generated by the pupils is covering the noise coming from the outside. It's also reported to be the most disturbing source of noise for teachers and pupils. And finally, well, then you can, um, you can discuss it with pupils and potentially find solutions because they are generating the noise themselves. Um, and I here will focus on moderate um, level of noise. So um, basically the noise that um, corresponds to the level of a conversation or um, group conversation, not very, very high level that are really like just harmful for your ears, such as when you hear like a uh, building work that is very loud or like an ambulance. Um, and the first uh, experimental studies about noise and how it impacts learning and performance uh, looked at memory. So, um, and these studies involved adults and children, um, and they specifically asked people to uh, remember lists. So it's a task of serial recall. Um, so they gave a, a list of participants that was displayed visually on a screen. So list of digits, for example, uh, or letters, and, and they had to remember this information. And what they found is that three types of noise interfere with people's memory in this situation. Uh, the first type of noise is verbal noise. Uh, so noise that contains uh, meaning or phonological information. So the information from the sound of language. And so that would be like an obvious example. Okay. Bonzo was a rough haired fox terrier. So if you're someone telling you a story or like something irrelevant to your task. Um, and why this type of noise is negative is because um, when you are trying to remember a list, uh, you are basically re rehearsing it in your head. So if I'm trying to remember three, five, seven, uh, I will kind of repeat them in my head. And according to the models of working memory from Badly, you have like an internal articulation for that. But if at the same time you hear some um, uh, language, um, well, you're also gonna process it by the same system. And so then you are dealing with a lot of information at the same time, and, and this is causing a problem for your memory performance. Um, so that was for the first type of sound. The second type of sound um, is um, ir irregular noise. So it's not necessarily when you hear someone else talking to you, it's just when you hear um, something that isn't expected and surprising. Um, so for example, if you are working and you hear your phone ringing or for a child in a classroom, that would be um, um, the bell ringing or that would be 
um, hearing some someone dropping something on the floor very uh, um, unexpectedly. Um, and so here it's not much because your processing uh, language is uh, maybe because your attention is driven away from the task you're trying to do. So you're, you're, you're distracting in this way. Uh, and the third type of sound that um, is interfering with um, memory um, in this uh, serial recall task is noise that is composed of a series of ordered sounds. So um, it looks like a complicated sentence. It just means that if you are trying to remember a list, if you hear another list at the same time that you need to keep track of order both visually and in what you hear, and it's like too much order to process and you have an interference. And I will not talk too much about this type of sounds uh, because I think it's not, it doesn't happen very naturally in uh, classrooms or in learning settings. Um, so basically now that I've highlighted three different types of, not, of sounds that interfere with memory performance, um, what can we do about that? Like, um, it looks all a bit negative. And some solutions have been proposed. Um, the first one that I found really uh, elegant is to actually cover um, the, the background noise with uh, nature sounds. So I think we, we have all been in this situation where were, we were trying to focus on something and we could hear some ir irrelevant sounds in the background and we put our headphones on to try to cover it. And this study shows that uh, it's about yeah, particularly efficient to use nature sounds. So it's like bird singing and water flowing. Um, and basically when, um, when people use these type of sounds, they perform as well as they do in quiet. Um, but obviously if they hear some um, verbal sound, their performance is impaired, but covering it with nature sounds helps. Um, a second solution um, seems a bit counterintuitive is to add add more voices, add more mess to the noise. Um, and imagine a situation in which you are in a cafe, you are trying to work and you hear a lot of different people talking and it's, um, you don't really hear what they say, but it's kind of um, background bubble. Um, and imagine another situation where you have one other person in the cafe that is having a conversation on the phone and you can hear everything they say. And so it's likely that the second situation is more disturbing because you, you really process everything that people say. Uh, and so this is a graph from um, a paper from Jones um, who is basically uh, showing, which is basically showing that if you add more voices, the number of errors at the memory task is uh, lower. Uh, so these two studies about solutions are on adult populations. Um, now, how much does it generalize to children and to classroom situations? Um, so if you look at experiments uh, with children, um, you can see a similar pattern in that um, verbal noise. So when you really hear someone speaking, it's usually more negative to their performance than uh, mixed noise, so a type of noise when you hear different people talking with some movement. Um, so that's the case for um, reading performance in particular, where verbal noise usually has a negative impact, whereas mixed noise has either no impact or a positive one. Uh, and for mathematics, usually verbal noise has less of a negative impact, but still some studies find it, uh, whereas mixed noise has either no impact or positive impact. Um, and I will play you the mixed noise. So I will play you the verbal noise again, just like to make it better. Bonzo was a rough haired fox terrier. And the mixed noise. So these are audio files I'm using because it's actually hard to know what people have been using in their specific study. Um, and what is puzzling in these results, when you, you look at different studies on children, is that well, why would you have why would noise be beneficial? So these studies about mixed noise, they show that sometimes children who are placed in a situation when there is background noise, they perform better at reading in math class. So why would that be the case? And sorry, there is a bit of a mess with the sound file here. Um, and 
so I found two different interpretations when I looked at our previous papers. The first one is that um, if you um, if your attention is driven away from the task, it's actually an opportunity to focus again. Um, so for that, um, imagine you're trying to work on um, something and you kind of your mind wandering a bit or you're not actually into what you're doing. And sometimes if you hear like a stimulation from the outside, you kind of realize that you're not fully into your work and you refocus. So there could be a potential mechanism. Uh, another explanation um, comes from creativity research. And it's the idea that if you're actually a little bit distracted, uh, it can help you to generate ideas. Um, and this comes from a study on undergraduate students, um, which show that they, they give more original ideas when they're, uh, when they're in a situation of moderate mixed noise compared to a quiet situation or a very loud situation. Um, and here's the idea that if you, if your attention is uh, redirected, actually it could be great because it helps you to not fixate on one idea, but to think about different creative ideas. Um, so attention here seems to be a big factor. And I think it's quite intuitive when you think about noise in everyday life as well. Um, so I had to look at what kind of research was existing on the topic. Um, and um, so the first approach that has been used in the literature was to compare adults and children. Um, so again, typically using um, memory tasks. Um, and these studies found that usually children are more impaired than adults by background noise when they are engaged in the memory task. So both adults and children are impaired, but children are more impaired. And researchers uh, interpret that as uh, an effect that shows that it's because children have lower attentional skills, so they're more impaired by uh, background noise. And I think it's a bit of a gap because they could be impaired because they have lower attention, but they have also a lot of other skills that are developing from adulthood, from childhood to adulthood. So they, uh, they are better with language, they're better at regulating their emotions, at keeping information in mind. So that's, uh, I think that's not completely satisfactory. Um, I had a look at studies on adult populations and here you have, you, you do have more studies looking at atten attentional skills and in particular Patrick Sorgovitz has done um, experiments where they ask adult participants to either do a memory task or, or read a text and answer comprehension questions. And they found that when, well, Typically, when you when you play some verbal noise in the background, they're impaired. But um, participants who are better able to filter out irrelevant distractors or irrelevant information um, are more resistant, so they are less impaired by noise. And again, the study from Meta and collaborators about creativity shows that uh, in a situation where uh, undergraduate students are asked to do a creative task if they hear some background noise, they do feel distracted. So they have a self-report of attention. So people feel that they are distracted, but here it's promoting their creativity. So in both cases, you have a role of attention. Um, and when I started my PhD, um, we didn't have evidence on children. So I was wondering, is that the case for children as well? Can you, can you find differences in terms of how well their attention uh, allows them to work with noise? And can also can noise be also positive for them in some cases, such as in the case of a creativity task. Um, and so I will present here or one of the first study of my PhD. So it was on a small sample of elementary school children from five to 11 years of age. So it was more a proof of concept about this idea of um, understanding how selective attention plays a role in dealing with noise. And uh, we did it with Kathy Rogers. Um, uh, who, who has done a PhD on creativity, and Denny Marishal and Natasha Kirkham uh, were my supervisors. Um, and we asked um, children to do two creativity tasks. So in the first one, it's called the alternative uses task. Um, and they have to generate as many potential uses as they could think of for a plastic bottle. So 
lots of different uses. So you can uh, you can use a, a plastic bottle to contain liquid, but also you can transform it into a robot or um, plant pot, uh, add plants in it, etc. Um, and this has been used in the studies showing that uh, undergraduate students perform better uh, with noise. And a second task was um, to imagine uh, a fictional situation. So we were saying to children, imagine uh, there was a big fog and we could only see people's feet. Imagine what, what will happen. Um, and so in both tasks, they were prompted to come up with different ideas. Uh, and basically we counted how many ideas they gave for, they gave for each task. So that's a fluency measure and also how original their ideas were. So for that, for the alternative use task, we just ask four people to rate each idea on a scale from one to five, like how creative do you find this idea? And people usually agree on that. Um, and for the second task, it was, um, there was a protocol like a guide to score um, the answers. But the idea is that basically, if an answer is not very frequent, if children tend to give an answer not frequently, it means that it's more original. And we measured selective attention um, with two tasks. So they were drawn from the executive function literatures for those who are working in the field. Um, and the first task um, is the flanker task. So children had to say in which direction the middle fish is pointing. So on the right, so they had to press a key on the computer to say that. Um, and in easy trials, all the fish point to the same direction, but in the hard trials, the middle fish is surrounded by distractors. And so how we measure selective attention is by measuring how much longer children take um, for the hard trials compared to the easy one. They're, they're, they get the answer correct, but it's just, it takes longer because they have to kind of um, filter out these distractors. And for the stroop task, it was programmed by Sumoris at UCL. Um, here it's the same idea, but they had to, to indicate which was the biggest animal in real life. So um, here you can see you have a lion and a rabbit, so it's the lion. And in the easy trials, um, the lion is also the biggest on the screen, but in the hard trials, it's quite small. So you have to just answer based on your knowledge and not pay attention to the actual size of the images. And again, to measure selective attention, you check how much longer children take to reply to the hard trials compared to the easy ones. Um, so what we found, and here that's where I'm saying that whether the noise is um, negative or not depends on your task. So for the alternative uses tasks, think of uses for a bottle. It had no impact of noise, so it was um, either positive or negative. Um, it didn't depend on age or selective attention. However, for the second task, so when uh, children were presented with imaginary situations, um, we found that um, the impact of noise depending on this selected, selective sorry, attention um, as measured by the flanker task. So what you can see on the graph, so I don't know how big it looks on your screen. Um, so I will just uh, talk you through. So on the left, you have um, the data for children with low selective attention. And you can see that they give less ideas in noise. So it's like the red, reddish orange um, dots and the line uh, compared to silence, which is blue. But children with high selective attention uh, gave ideas that were as original in silence and noise. And by high selective attention, I mean that these children actually, they, they, were, not, they were not affected by distracting fish. So for them, it, they were as fast for easy or hard trials, and they were also good at um, filtering out the noise apparently. So you seem to have a process of attention here and the ability to select what you want to pay attention to. Um, and also we had a three-way interaction. So it's always something that makes you a bit freak out when you see your statistics. Um, but basically it meant that the impact of noise depended on uh, children's age and their selective attention. So I split the group in two. So you have the younger children between five and eight years of age and the older one between uh, 
from up to eight to 11 years of age. Um, and for the younger children, um, what you can see here is that those with low selective attention, they, they have ideas that are less original than the ideas given in science. But when they had high selective attention, uh, the originality of the ideas was the same in silence or noise. And for the older children, um, again, the originality was the same, was not different in noise and silence. Um, and so you can see the glass as half empty of, or half full. So you can say, oh, young children, low selective attention can be particularly impaired for this uh, creativity task when we measure the originality of the ideas. Um, and that's the thing in itself because um, actually classrooms for younger children are usually noisiest because that's when they're engaged in lots of different activities, often group work, and the date, research data shows that their classrooms are actually particularly noisy. Uh, but you can also see the glass as half full and, and consider that what well, if children have the ability to handle distraction, then they are not um, impelled by noise. Um, so that was a study on creativity. And what is nice is that very recently, um, a colleague from um, Birkbeck University, Gera Gera, so you can see the reference um, on the bottom line here, she has used a reading task. Uh, and she has shown as well that um, basically, um, when you add, this time she used verbal noise, uh, when children are in the presence of verbal noise, those with better selective attention were well, less uh, impaired. So we use different tasks with a slightly different protocol, but we, we found this evidence that you do have variability between children. And I think it's quite positive that we, we came up with the same conclusion about that. So attentional skills are one thing. So here with these tasks, I was really trying to see if you can resist distractions, but there is another way to approach the issue of noise, which is that some people, it's not that they don't pay attention to noise, it's just that they pay attention to it, but they manage to go back to their tasks. So imagine um, in the situation where you are trying to work with a, a TV on the background, sometimes it can be that you, um, you, pay a bit attention to what's going on in the TV show and then you go back to your task and again to the TV show. And as I'm speaking about that, I, I remember my sister who used to, to study while watching a tennis tournament and she could keep track of the scores by doing that. So um, here is not only attention, it's switching skills. So your ability to move from one task to another. And if you look at studies on adult populations, um, so this is a study by career, um, Adults who report having difficulties to switch from one task to another also report being more distracted by noise. And in a study with French pupils who were in their late elementary school years, so they were 10 years on average, uh, we've replicated these findings basically. So pupils who were reporting having difficulties to switch from one task to another, they were also more annoyed and distracted by classroom noise. We can see it the other way and say those with good switching skills were less annoyed and less distracted. Um, and that was um, that was interesting to see, but um, I wanted to complement that with some behavioral data. So actually, how can we measure people's switching skills? And so I've set up a project with um, a master's student, Precious Monas, this year to uh, measure. Uh, children switching skills in, and, and see how it relates to how they cope with noise. Everything was set up and ready to go. Um, and as you can guess, the schools shut down so we could not run the project. But instead, um, we moved the project online and Precious worked with undergraduate student instead. Um, and she did a really good job at moving the study online and also at, well, recruiting people in this context. Um, and so she recruited 51 undergraduate students between 18 and 23 years of age. What is quite good is that there were uh, students in psychology, but also in business or economics. So it's not only a study about psychology with people from psychology. Um, and we use this alternative use this task again because it's, it's, the, um, it's easier to compare our results with adult studies using this alternative use this task. So try to think of as many different uses as you can think of for a bottle. 
and again you counted how many ideas they gave and the originality so uh, of each answer and then the average originality for a participant and there was an alternative version about a uh, hanger and so participants performed one of these alternative uses task uh, in quiet so they were sitting at their desk at their table with headphones but no no sound was displayed any situation of ambient cafe noise displayed at a much better level um, and the way we did that is to ask them to set up the volume of their computer at 60 percent capacity and uh, at the very end of the study we also asked like uh, how they perceived the noise what they what they heard and how they felt about it and they all heard the noise they reported being more or less distracted depending on the people but um they, they did hear the noise so although it was um, a distant study we um, we are quite confident that the, the stimulation was as intended. Um, and the way we measured switching skill was by using the dimensional change card sort. <laughs> I've always struggled to say this. Um, and so they see a figure. Um, so here in the middle of the screen, so red square. And they have to sort it either by shape or color. So if they sort it by shape, they say, oh, it's a square, it goes to the right. Or by color, you say, oh, it's red, it goes to the left. And typically, so we use the task developed by uh, Adele Diamond and Natasha Kirkham. Um, you start by asking them to sort the shape by one dimension. So let's say color, then you change for shape. And then you add a block where you mix shape and color. So they always have to switch. Uh, and we use the, the reaction time, response time for these um, switching trials as a measure of the switching skills. What did we see in the results? So uh, we did some data cleaning. Um, I can give you more details about that if you're interested, but we ended up working on data from 42 participants because we had to check that um, they didn't have any internet disconnection, that their accuracy was good enough, that they were engaged in the task. Uh, and we found no main effect of noise. So on average, when they had this additional coffee noise, uh, they were not performing worse at the creativity task. Um, but, um, and also there was no main effect of switching skills. So they were not better if they, at the creativity task if they would have better switching skills. However, how the noise impacted them depending on how, how good they were at switching. So to illustrate this on the graph, um, so we took the, the, the switching score and we split the group in two with the median. And so those who had low switching skills uh, here it's in terms of the number of ideas they gave at the AUT. So low switching skills, they, um, they gave the same amount of ideas in silence and noise. The difference was not significant. And the participants with high switching skills, they gave more ideas in noise. Um, and it was actually the first time in my entire research, uh, but no, it's not that I've been in the field for 20 years, but still, um, it was the first time I could see that in some cases noise could be positive for all this specific group of participants that were undergraduate students with good switching skills. And I think, I think it's really interesting to see. Um, and so I hope that by showing these different studies, um, I managed to give you an overview of how um, we can uh, see different aspects when we think about the impact of noise on learning and performance. So we need to take into account uh, academic achievement or performance, whatever task you choose as the task you want to be good at. So reading, math, memory, creativity. Uh, we need to take into account um, the way people understand each other in situations where there is background noise and that's when noise can be really detrimental and we also need to think about people's well-being like well-being is a big word but like how they feel about noise how annoying it is for them uh, and when considering the impact of noise on task performance we really need to think about what kind of sound they hear um, what kind of tasks are trying to do and whether people have more or less good attentional skills and switching skills. There might also be other factors that are um, important to consider, but th these um, 
this presentation highlighted very, really like these first two factors about being considered um, in the literature. And so how do we do about that? Like if you come from like a, an educator's perspective or if, if you want to have like a take home message, like what, what do you do with it in learning situations? And um, because the impact of noise is quite dependent on the context, I think uh, it's good to use collaborative approaches and creative approaches to actually empower the pupils and the teachers to regulate noise levels in the classroom when the noise is generated by classroom activities. Um, and so in a project I've been uh, doing in France, we have collaborated with educators and we've put in place sound awareness workshops. So we had an artist, Tommy, he's on the picture, and he's really small on the picture. Um, so he went to classrooms and explained uh, what sounds are, uh, what different types of sounds we can hear in our life, when they get annoying, when they become noise because they are really disturbing what we're trying to do. Um, and we also gave a practical tool for teachers to use, which was this visual panel. So it was basically put on the wall in front of the classroom and you had the color code. So green is for low level of noise, so it's quite quiet. Uh, orange is more direct level, so when people are engaged in conversations. Um, and red is like really when these conversations are getting really loud um, or when they, they, there is some very really high noise um, in the classroom um, that exceeds like the typical level of a conversation. Um, and so it would get updated like from minute to minute. Um, and the idea here is that children could see it and regulate depending on the context, um, the noise level. So maybe in a situation of group work, you don't really mind if you're in the orange zone, but when there is a silent reading task or an exam, you, you want to be in the, in the green zone. Um, and we had two classrooms engaged in these um, interventions. We had two other groups. So one was a control group who um, did nothing special. They would have interventions later on. And two other classrooms um, received mindfulness interventions um, for the reasons that we can develop later. But what we saw is that um, the classrooms that were participating in these sound awareness interventions, they had a reduction in noise levels after these intervention. The thing is, because we had uh, only two classrooms, also two classrooms in the control is really specific to the classrooms and the, the, the people you're working with. And our control classrooms also got quieter over time. However, it's only in the sound awareness intervention that we saw that the pupils were getting less distracted and less annoyed by noise. So it's possible that if you empower them with some tools to regulate the noise and reflect on it, they actually felt less distracted in the noise because they have the tools to regulate it. And it's, it's really something that comes up in the literature that your sense of control is important uh, when considering whether you're annoyed uh, by noise or not. Um, and I know there are some tools also used by teachers in classrooms, such as apps that are showing noise levels or other types of visual cues and I'm really happy to to hear more from these approaches as well so that we can have, uh, generalize this to even uh, more platforms. So I really thank you for your attention. I hope uh, I hope this made sense <laughs> um, and I would like to thank so um, Denis Marichaud and Natasha Kirkham who are my PhD supervisors, Philip Proceto who helped a lot to develop these interventions with teachers and basically all the work with teachers Kathy Rogers for the creativity study and my current team at UCL who has um, kindly allowed me to like take some time um, to do this presentation. And obviously I would like to thank all the children and the teachers and the family who are engaged in our activities. So if you want to reach out, I've put my email address and Twitter account. Uh, so feel free to use them. Thank you very much, Jess, for a fascinating talk and you know, Lots of uh, information already in there for practical use as well. I'm, I'm welcoming now any other uh, questions people may have. You can either put them in the chat or you can just um, put your video on or unmute yourself to ask your question. You might have done a fantastic job. <laughs> it's impossible to end the question. Um,
I like the intervention at the end. I was just wondering what your thoughts were about, it seems to be that there's a lot of individual differences in here and whether that might be a challenge in terms of your practical solutions. Unless I misunderstood, like how can you make that work from an individual point of view? Yeah, so that's, yes, it's true. Um, so that's like a classroom level solution. So it has more to do about how you regulate you noise know, depending on the context and the activities children are engaged in, not individual characteristics. Uh, but there are, um, there are other things that I think would worth um, trying, which is uh, once you raise awareness about that, so how about you give sound cancelling headphones or you give um, objects that children can use, you know, you have you can have a quiet corner, like so, something, it's difficult, you cannot change the design of the classroom in one day, but you know, maybe using sound cancelling headphones or these ideas of using sound cover uh, the background could be useful. And, and I think that's the kind of solution that can mainly come from collaborations with teachers because they have a sense of what's possible in the classroom um, to do so. Are there any questions for Jess? I'm not sure I can see the chat, so I don't know if there is anything. No, there is a chat. Um, the recording will be available after the talk. Yeah, it's uh, available on the YouTube channel from the Center of Educational Neuroscience. So that's the question we've got. Oh, who we got here? Can't see. Natasha, we're... Yeah. Could I ask a question? I, I'm kind of... Um... I, I'm a bit confusing because I've just been in another talk for experimental psychology in Oxford and I've just jumped across, but I'm Kathy Manning. <laughs> um, okay. Would you, and I, I miss, I did miss the first bit of the talk because I was jumping across from another talk, um, but would you expect the same kind of, uh, for children who, um, who struggle with auditory noise to also struggle from visual noise in the classroom? You know, like lots of bright posters and things. Would you think it'd be the same Kind of thing yeah so uh, that's a really good question and actually i think if you um um if you notice the the selective attention tasks i chose were um visual tasks and afterwards it was like oh i should have i could have used as well like task of auditory selective attention so there seems to be like maybe a common ground there um but if so there is a really um nice work done by Paul Matthews in Switzerland, where they use uh, auditory distractors and also visual distractors and the combination of both. Um, and yeah, I, I'm not able to tell you on the top of my hand because it depends on, again, the age of the children. Um, but um, that would be interesting to see if it's the same type of profile. Um, Yes, so I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> I'm kind of moving the question to another line of work, but I think the fact that we use visual um, selective attention does make it uh, likely that there is a, a common factor and also some very sp specific like auditory processes, but it can be like a central attentional phenomenon. Thank you, Catherine, for your question. Um, Caroline Witten also has a question. Go ahead, Caroline. Thank you. Um, yes, my question was that there seemed to be a, um, a subset of children who actually need noise to concentrate. I know of several of these who um, they actually say without noise, I can't concentrate and I, I need that stimulation to keep me stimulated. So I just wondered what your reaction was to that. It's, it's rather like people listening to music if they're doing exams and things and revising. Some will have one type of music, some will have another and others will have none at all. Yes, that's a really good point. So are you mentioning, for example, uh, children with um, ADHD actually or extroverts? Yeah, I, I think probably a combination, maybe possibly ADHD, also maybe sensor integration issues. So, so there is some research, um, um, I think it's mainly on um, people with ADHD and children with ADHD using white noise. So white noise is like a uh, noise from, you know, like shh, a very like stable frequency um, that could uh, be helpful for some children because um, they would need um, to be more aroused. So this is usually related to um, 
their baseline level of simulation. So some people can be easily distracted and um, some others would need like extra simulation to kind of have them reach their optimal level of like focus and um, engagement. And so for uh, children with ADHD or extroverts as well would need more stimulation to focus on the task. Uh, and I think this, um, this is again a big gap, I think in the research because um, what I saw so far is usually using this kind of white noise that um, is great, but it's not really a classroom situation. Um, and also the work about um, extroversion um, is about uh, adults. So there, there is still a lot to do, yes. And um, Jess, I'm gonna take a few questions first from the chat box, if that's okay. Um, so Michael Thomas is asking, do you think the variable noise conditions experienced by children at home may contribute to educational attainment gaps? So we know, for example, um, that some um, households will have more children in one room or have to study at the same time, for example, because they don't have their own rooms or their own quiet space to study. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so you have, um, so I think you have two aspects of it. So you have the noise that is happening when you are trying to do your task. So uh, you're trying to do your homework and you hear some background noise. Um, and that relates to the, the experiments I've been presenting. But there is also in this, in the, when you think about um, noisy homes or noisy neighborhoods, you also have the cumulative impact of noise over time. And this cumulative impact of noise um, could affect uh, children's sleep uh, and children's capacity to hear language as well. So imagine that you really live like under um, a fly path um, and you constantly have noise so you have more stress you sleep uh, your sleep is worse and you're always interrupted in your conversation so over time it's not only that when you're engaged in a task it can be a problem it's also like over time your resources get a bit exhausted and there, there have been two different ideas presented in the literature that actually either children's attention gets exhausted or it gets better because they learn to deal with noise but I think when you look at the data and when um, uh, when you actually um, measure the chaos in the home, so it's a site study that we have done where we use the measure of home chaos um, and also children's attentional skills. Um, when when there is a, a relation, it's often negative. So more chaos is is related to worse attentional skills when that's the case, um, more than the opposite. So it's interesting, isn't it? So they don't get more used to it over time and then to do better. It, does, it doesn't help in a way. That, or do, would it help some children within those groups? Um, well, if you think about, so in terms of their attentional skills, they might be affected, but there is also this idea of like, feeling comfortable to work in the environment that you're used to. So that's more of something related to, to mood or, um, or, or your, your memory of like the situation in which you engage when you learn. Um, and yes, for this, I don't know. Uh, Brittany, so Brittany Sher, she's, um, I don't know if she's here, but she's doing a PhD on noise as well with uh, younger children. And she did a study where um, they compared children living in a more or less noisy, houses and how children perform an attentional task in the younger ages as well. So um, that, that would be great to refer to our work for that, yes. Brilliant. And um, uh, Iras, did you have a question you want to ask? Um, yeah, I was just wondering, I might have missed it, um, but whether you've been thinking about it in terms of the perceptual low theory of like Neely Levy's um, theory, well, there's this idea that, you know, how much distractors affect you depend on the load, the current load of the task you're doing. And it relates a little bit of the question that someone had mentioned before is that if you're not doing a task, maybe that's engaging enough. If you have a bit of uh, music, it might just make you, you know, in the right zone to concentrate. But for some people, it might be too much or not enough. And so that really depends on the, the load of the task you're doing right now. 
So if the kids are doing coloring in, maybe mm. music or noise will be fine. But if the kid is trying to do some like letters, then um, noise is going to be effect like more affected. And I think at different ages, you'll be more or less able to to cope with these distractors depending on the load. So I just wondered whether you had thought about it in that framework. Yes, and yes, and the uh, the concept came to mind when I was replying to this question actually. Uh, and it's a framework that we've used with um, another one of my master's students this year where uh, we vary task difficulties so children were engaged in an attentional task. Um, and um, it's still preliminary data, so that's why I haven't presented it. But um, basically, the idea was to have classroom noise and in other situation, you cover it with white noise. Um, and it's... Um, whether it's efficient really depends on your task difficulty. Um, and, and it did well. So the protective impact was more for the situation which is hard, which is a bit difficult. So I think this cognitive law theory, you really have to find the right kind of threshold because sometimes it's also because if the task is harder, you're more engaged and less prone to distractions. Um, but also for your children, you, you really have to know where, where something becomes uh, too hard and that they cannot engage that much and then they are just more vulnerable to distraction. But that, that's a really use, useful framework to think of. Brilliant. Natasha, did you have a question for Jess? Oh, you just thought no, that's all right because you got a video out. Um, and I think Precious has already kindly answered a question that Madeline had about um, whether there are any uh, projects on atypical. I've got one more um, from Samuel asking, is it possible to engage on a collaborative research as an extension to the information presented, but now in my context? Um, so I think, I'm not sure I understand. Feel free to unmute yourself, Sam, Samuel, to ask your question or to contact Jess maybe afterwards directly. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, my question I was uh, asking if, based on the information that has uh, been presented here, is it possible for me to team up with uh, the presenter so that we can be able to conduct maybe a joint research? But now, in my context, I mean in my country or in my school with my learners. I, I think that's a great question to answer. Um, maybe outside of the meeting. So Jess has kindly provided her contact details um, on the slide. I don't know whether you can see it, but if not, um, we'll uh, put you in touch if that's okay. Yes, definitely send me an email and we can uh, we can discuss about it. As I said at the beginning of the presentation, I'm, it's not my main research area anymore, but we, we can see what's possible. And also like uh, um, even just discussing it, sometimes it, it's helpful. Um, so yeah, feel free to email me and can have a private conversation. Thank well, you. Nicely, thank you. Eva. Well, we nicely made it to almost five o'clock, so it's been perfect timing, Jeff, on your behalf. And thank you all for people who've asked the questions. I think it's a very interesting area of research to really get an understanding of, you know, what impacts on uh, children's learning or other people, you know, adult learning as well and the individual differences in there. So yeah, a round of applause for Jess for a fantastic talk. <laughs> And we all look forward to seeing you again, people who are listening or have joined us today for next week and uh, when we have another talk. Um, and I should have known by who, but obviously, you know, I've been teaching all afternoon, so I'm not so prepared, but um, we'll send an email round um, and tomorrow and on Monday to remind you um, about the next speaker that's been lined up. Thank you again for listening and for joining us and uh, see you all next time. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, yes, again. Bye-bye.